Sometimes ArxJS is the perfect tool for the job. If you've used it for the wrong job in the past, you may have had a bad experience and never want to touch it again. But if you stay open-minded, it can sometimes help you prevent your code base from exploding into complex spaghetti code. We've seen what happens when you use RxJS for synchronous reactivity. Now let's try to use signals to implement asynchronous behavior. I have uh, put a link in the description for this exact project. This is the Angular Tetris app. This is a dinosaur from the opening screen. And uh, let's look at the implementations. I'll have links to these as well. Here's RxJS and here is signals. The most noticeable difference between RxJS and Signals is the number of lines of code required to implement this feature. You have 30 lines of code for RxJS and 123 for Signals. More code takes longer to understand and leaves more room for mistakes and is harder to change. The next interesting difference is in the level of abstraction. This RxJS code becomes this with Signals. Because the thing is, RxJS operators define actual behavior. If you don't use them explicitly, you will be redefining them, but in a scattered way and coupled to complex business logic. So a developer who understands RxJS operators automatically understands a lot more potential behavior of real apps. So if they come across a code base that already uses RxJS, they're going to start ahead of a developer who doesn't know RxJS or any developer who comes across a code base the equivalent code base that's defined without RxJS. So learning RxJS is a good investment for your career. Next is debugging. So when something's wrong, what do you do? Usually the most straightforward thing is to inspect the thing that's wrong. So you might click on it. And if you clicked on this, uh, it's called dragon in the code, but uh, yeah, you click on it and you look at the template, you'll see dragon class dollar async. So what happens when you click the definition on that? You'll see this concat with uh, three streams and then repeat infinity. So it's cycling between three different behaviors. And so what does concat do? Well, it just concatenates those behaviors and repeat does what it sounds and is repeating infinity times. So this is really cool because you can directly click to the definition of what you're interested in instead of picking a random place in the code and trying to find it from there. So it's just a series of inspect, click to definition, click to definition, click to definition until you get to the thing that you're interested in. So this is really great debugging experiences or experience because RxJS enables uh, declarative syntax for asynchronous behavior. And that is, that is extremely valuable. So we need to talk more about declarative code. So what is declarative code? Declarative code is where each declaration completely defines a value across time. The answer to the question, why is this thing behaving this way, is always answered in its declaration, not somewhere else. Non-declarative code, on the other hand, only initializes values. Then it leaves it up to scattered imperative code to define subsequent behavior. So to answer the question, why is this behaving this way, you have to find all references to that variable, understand the context of each of those references, then determine if and how those references are controlling that variable. Let's look at some examples. First, UI. So a declarative way would be Angular or JSX or one of these templates that lets you react to values in TypeScript. And the non-declarative uh, example would be something like vanilla JavaScript, something we used to do. So ID equals count is is just a way for imperative code to be able to define behavior after the initial behavior, because the initial behavior is just right there, it's zero, but then to define further behavior, you require JavaScript with an imperative command telling it to change. The next example is variables, we already saw this. Uh, const count equals zero, that's always gonna be zero, it doesn't, it doesn't rely on anything else to tell it what to be later on. Non-declarative, when you see let count equals zero, you know that either it should have been named const or it's not really declarative because its behavior is defined later in a scattered place. The next example is state. So a declarative example of state is where you have an observable like an increment event stream 
and you convert that into state with a scan operator where it says it's starting at zero and every time the increment event emits it's going to increase it by one so that's a count observable in that state and then you can convert it to a signal with two signal both of these here are constants nothing from the outside is ever going to command them to be anything different that's what makes them declarative the Im imperative example is sort of common you see this probably a lot or you will uh, const count equals signal what you know about this is that it will it's it's like a standalone thing that isn't reacting to anything else but it's kind of waiting to be commanded to change so this is technically not declarative and it only gets more controversial from here so effect events so the declarative way to handle effects is to just declare the result of them uh, as starting from let's say increment request and then you pipe to a merge map and you do that side effect but now that's a stream of the result of that side effect and that is encapsulated into the variable the stream increment so nothing from the outside is ever going to call dot next on increment or define its behavior all right the non-declarative way would be like ngx effects or i guess redux observable probably did this um where you create an action and technically that's declarative but but effectively the way you use it is that you're creating a stream so the thing that's technically not declarative is the store itself because you're calling dispatch on it but the way you think about it is like the action is itself a stream so when you have an an effect here that defines when that action is going to be dispatched or when that stream will be em emitted from it will uh it will be defining it at another place and so that technically it, it's effectively not declarative so yeah all right and then last is something that isn't common at all but uh the, technically the way to do ui ui events in a declarative way is to uh define a stream as something that references the source of those events and listens to uh, the the event it's the event it's interested in so this stream is defining itself it's not waiting for something else to define it whereas this the more traditional way of doing it is to define a subject something that will eventually contain events but you don't know where those are coming from yet this stream right here is not completely defined right here so you know that something's not declarative if it requires some imperative statement. So, like imperative means command. So this here is commanding it to emit. It's calling dot next, do something. This is, this is imperative, which makes this not declarative. Its behavior is being defined elsewhere. So some of you may not be used to coding declaratively. So uh, what's the motivation for doing this? What are the benefits? First one is focus. When you're working on declarative code, you are not having to worry about imperative commands that are going to change that behavior from elsewhere. So you can literally just focus on that one thing and, and ignore the entire rest of the world and just focus on defining that one thing you're working on right now. The next benefit is debugging. When state is defined all in one place or any behavior, it's a lot easier to track bugs down because everything that's defining that behavior is in one place, so the bug is going to be right there. So uh, if it's imperative or non-declarative, though, you'll have to check all the references and track down the bug. So it's less convenient to debug. It's also easier to avoid bugs in the first place because while you're working on that state, you can just look and see everything else that's controlling that state. So you can be reminded of patterns that you're supposed to be applying in the new situation. Whereas with imperative code, you uh, would have to also track that down. And the last benefit is comprehension. It's easier to comprehend declarative code because uh, imperative code consists of callback functions where state, out of context state, is being controlled. And so there a lot of different contexts you have to be aware of all at the same time uh, whereas with declarative code 
you're focusing on one behavior. And so it's easy to understand everything that's happening. I guess that's kind of a secondary benefit of focus, but anyway, comprehension. So how declarative are our implementations using ArcGIS and signals? I color coded each line of code by what behavior or state is defining and ArcGIS is completely declarative and signals is pretty imperative. That's because signals and computeds can only be declarative for synchronous behavior. They are synchronously reactive. As soon as time enters the equation, you're going to need an effect and a lot of imperative code to manage out of context state. So currently, ArcGIS operators are the only way to have declarative code for asynchronous behavior with, with Angular. So these ArcGIS operators, they define a, a reactive relationship between two variables. But it's an asynchronous relationship, and there are many potential asynchronous relationships. Here there's a delay, there's also debounce, but there are many others because asynchronicity involves an entirely new dimension of complexity. That's why there are so many operators and why all of them are necessary if you want to write declarative code. Currently, ArcGIS is the only way to do that. But are we going to always have to rely on just ArcGIS operators? I think maybe no. ArcGIS operators are just functions, and they're functions that take in observables and return observables, basically. So couldn't we just create some functions that do that for signals? Let's try one with delay. Uh, so this actually works. Uh, I'll let you look at the source code and have a link to the article in the description where you can find the actual source code. But it basically defines an output signal and then sets a relationship between them where it's setting a timeout. And I don't think this extra uh, semicolon is necessary, but anyway. So this is how you use it. It is 100% declarative. So you get the benefit that you're looking for with an ArcGIS operator, but you're staying in signal land. You don't have to convert between observables and signals. So this is pretty cool. However, look how many ArcGIS operators there are. We're just, just scratching the surface with this one operator. So in the short term, we're not going to be able to replace ArcGIS with a ton of our own signal operators. It's going to take a monumental effort basically. So here's my advice. When you feel like you want to start writing imperative code with signals, you want to use an effect. Instead, try to go through these steps. First, try to reorganize the code to use a computed instead. If that doesn't work, use an existing signal operator. So copy the code I just showed you if you're trying to just have a signal be delayed. Um, if you can't find one, write a new custom signal operator. And if you don't have time, convert to observables and use an ArcGIS operator. But whatever you do, just avoid effect. Try to avoid effect. Your code will be declarative and cleaner. I'm going to have a lot more on this later, but uh, this is where I am right now. So those that's the advice that I have. And eventually I will have hopefully a library of signal operators for you to use. So in conclusion, this feature actually was pretty asynchronous. In the real world, your app will land somewhere on the spectrum between synchronous and asynchronous. But however asynchronous it is, ArcGIS can help you. It can keep your code base clean, relatively bug-free, and easier to debug. So the key thing you want to remember is to avoid effect. Try to use a computed. If you can't, use a signal operator if one exists. If it doesn't, create a signal operator. If you don't have time, just use RxJS. RxJS can help.